materials for present and future researchers. This event is also co-sponsored by the NYU Center for Multicultural Education and Programs, NYU Program in American Studies, and the NYU Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. And uh, in, in, in the course of their programming, their dynamic, exciting programming, which if you're not already on the newsletter, the email list you should check out, especially since they work with so many different organizations on, on campus, um, is, is uh, the reason why we're here today, which is, is really exciting. Uh, my name is Reka, a.k.a. DJ Reka. I was actually an artist in residence here in 2006 and 2007. Um, I'm currently teaching full-time uh, at the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music uh, at NYU Tisch. I'm a DJ educator and activist, and I do a monthly uh, club night here called Basement Bangra around the corner uh, at El, uh, La Poisson Rouge. But to get it started here, to set up the conversation, um, you know, sometimes you say yes, and then you say, okay, what do I really have to do? Um, so I said, sure. And then I, I looked at what I had to do, and I re-familiarized myself with the work of our two speakers today. And I was like, oh my god, introduce this topic. That, that's, it's a bit daunting. Um, and I think that's the point of it, that it is a bit daunting. Um, and uh, both, our, both our presenters have very uh, different styles and methods, um, but they're powerful in the way they speak about it. So the idea of post-race is really one of the touchstones of this conversation. So, um, you know, we talk a lot now about millennials, the younger folks, from my vantage point. Um, and I just want to uh, uh, quote a few things from, from that generation called the millennials. In a report uh, by ARC, Applied Research Center, in the 2011 report interviewing activists, uh, the report called, uh, Don't Call Them Post-Racial. Um, and this idea that we are living in a post-racial America, and that we are equal and we don't have to talk about it anymore, said Elena, a uh, 25-year-old Latina activist. Um, we, we do talk about it, but a lot of people shut down. Simon, a 25-year-old Latino Occupy Wall Street participant, agreed that when talking to the media, people just shut down when you mention race. It is a barrier to getting the message across. Other people's ignorance is a barrier. It's just hard because people's <laughs> ignorance makes them shut down and not seeing where you come from. Henry, a 28-year-old Korean-American community organizer in Portland, argued a bit more broadly that people just don't want to talk about race in general around the country and around the world because it makes people well, we're going to talk about it tonight. Um, and we're going to continue to talk about it. Just before I got on, I was talking with Jeff, and we're talking about how do you know when something's finished? A book, a mix, whatever. And uh, the truth is, it's never finished. So this conversation, hopefully, is just a good thing. So with this, I, I introduce Jeff Chang. Jeff Chang is the executive director of the Institute of, for Diversity in the arts and community on the black performing arts at Stanford University. Named, the Utney Reader, named by the Utney Reader as one of the 50 visionaries who are changing your world, Jeff Chang has been a USA Ford Fellow in Literature and a winner of the North Star News Prize. His first and most excellent book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, garnered many honors including the American Book Award and the Asian American Literary Award. He was the editor of Total Chaos, The Art and Aesthetics of Hip Hop. His current projects include Three new books, Who Will Be, The Colorization of America, forthcoming 2000, uh, this year at St. Martin's Press, Youth, uh, uh, Picador Big Ideas Small Book Series, and a biography of Bruce Lee, on, in, uh, published by Little Brown. He was a founding editor of Color Lines Magazine and co-founder, co-founding member of Soul Sides Hip Hop Collective, now Quantum Project. Born of Chinese and Native Hawaiian ancestry, Jeff was raised in Hawaii, and now lives in Berkeley, and he is also an Aries. Kia Se Lehman was born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. Lehman attended Millsaps College and Jackson State University before graduating from Oberlin College. 
He earned an MFA in Indiana University and is the author of the forthcoming novel, Long Division, uh, due June 11, 2013, uh, and a collection of autobi autobiographical essays. How to slow, uh, and a collection of autobiographical essays, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America, due out in August 2013. That's pretty cool, two books in, in the summer. Um, as well as a contributing editor at Gawker.com and a column, columnist at ESPN.com. He has written essays and stories for Esquire, ESPN, Gawker, Longman's Hip Hop Reader, NPR, Mythium, Politics and Culture. Lehman is currently an associate professor of English creative writing and co-director of Africana Studies at ASA. So let's get started with Jeff. And uh, I really want to thank the Asian Pacific American Institute here at NYU. I've been privileged to be able to uh, be a part of the programming that APA Institute has been doing for quite a while now. I don't want to say how many years, but um, uh, it's always uh, an amazing place. I got my master's degree from the UCLA Asian American Studies program, and I feel like uh, in a lot of ways NYU APA Institute is, is kindred. In a lot of ways, so coming here is like coming home. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, uh, and I thank you so much to Amita for pulling this together. We can give her a hat, right? Where is she? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really want to. I, I mean, uh, it's it's a beautiful thing. Even though Amita went to to Punahou, um, which is okay. Um, I, I, I'm so grateful for for, uh, for pulling this event together because I'm just I'm just in awe of Kese. Um, I'm just I'm about to stand myself here, but he's this is just amazing and his books, uh, which I've had the opportunity to be able to to read now, uh, they're they're the real deal. Uh, they will change a lot of 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 the ways that we we um, understand narrative about race at this particular point in, in our history, and I feel like uh, being able to be here tonight and speaking with him is a, is a real big deal for me. So thank you, Amita. Thank you, Kiese. Okay. Um, I'm going to do uh, a, a little bit of a reading here from uh, the book that I have coming out called Who We Be, The Colorization of America. And it's not really representative of what the book uh, is about. This is sort of the introduction. It's, it's sort of conceptual. Uh, the book is very narrative. Um, it's about trying to understand the way that we see race now uh, and the way that it's changed and hasn't changed over the last five decades. Um, so it starts in 1963 and it goes all the way up to, to right this moment. Um, literally right this moment because I'm still working on it. <laughs> and, uh, my editor hasn't cleaned it back yet, so I'm still going to be writing until she comes and cries out of my hands. Um, so this is a, a work in progress, and uh, uh, I'll start. Uh, it's called Seeing America, Introduction, Seeing America. For most of 2008, the most arresting image in America was a screen print by the street artist Shepard Ferry that appeared on posters, stickers, and clothing from sea to shining sea. The image was of a black and white man rendered in red, white, and blue. The man was named Barack Obama, and the four-letter word below his image was hope. Obama was, of course, the presidential candidate who had come from the far geographic and cultural edge of the United States, its Pacific borderland in Hawaii, to secure the Democratic Party nomination. He had run on a platform of mending a divided country. In a speech in March that he called a more perfect union, he offered his own biracial heritage, the unity of black, capital B, black and white histories in his own body as a symbol of empathy and reconciliation. That address, now popularly known as the race speech, was in some ways as historic as Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech delivered at the Lincoln Memorial almost 45 years earlier. The complexities of race that we've never really worked through, Obama said, remain a part of our union that we have yet to perfect. If Americans could move forward on race, he seemed to say, they could move forward on anything. For much of the U.S. first 200 years, it was a country defined predominantly by whiteness, drawn in grays, 
shades of white and black, not capital B black. But in fairy's print, Obama had been colorized, to coin a phrase, just as the country two and four, which he had become a symbol, a symbol, excuse me, had been colorized. Colorization describes those massive shifts that began taking place in the 1970s after the ebbing of the civil rights movement. These shifts have first been demographic, and more recently they've had political implications. But in between, and most thoroughly, they've been cultural. One in three Americans is now of color. They form the majority in a third of the country's most populous counties, and in forerunner states like California, Texas, New Mexico, and Hawaii. Demographers have become accustomed to naming each new cohort of youths, quote, the most diverse generation this nation has ever seen. Sometime before 2050, perhaps as early as 2042, the U.S. is expected to become, quote, unquote, majority minority, a term that seems stranger with each new set of census data. If no race is a majority, then everyone's a minority. This shift has had political consequences, too. In 2000, voters of color made up only 19% of the electorate, but in 2004, more than half of all new voters between the ages of 18 and 29 were black or Latino. In 2008, youth and voters of color turned out in record numbers, forming the foundation of the electorate that put Obama into office, and by 2012, more than a quarter of voters were of color. But what exactly have these changes meant culturally? This is what the U.S. has been trying to work out for the last 40 years, maybe 200 years, and what the nation may be working on for many, many more. Most of us will agree that race is not a biological question. Instead, it is a question of culture, and it begins as a visual problem, one of vision and visuality. Race happens in the gap between appearance and the perception of difference. It is about what we see, and what we think we see, and what we think about when we see. In that sense, it's about much more than personal affinities, preferences, tastes, and bonds. Ralph Ellison encapsulated the central problem of race and American vision and visuality in 1952. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me, his protagonist remarked in the famous prologue to Invisible Man. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings themselves are figments of their imagination, indeed, everything and anything but me. Difference is human. And noticing difference is human, it begins for us as babies from our very earliest days of perception. But of course, Ellison was pointing out that America's race problem came from something far deeper. For whites, historically, skin tone and physiognomy not only signaled difference, they signaled inferiority. This was the way that racial power worked. It went further than merely perceiving difference, it sorted difference into vast systems of freedom and slavery, commitment and neglect, investment and abandonment, mobility and containment. Then, it drew a veil over these systems and pretended not to have even seen difference in the first place. Racism, in other words, was supported by a specific kind of refusal, a denial of the possibility of empathy, a mass-willed blindness. In this context, the other's true self would always remain unseen. The musician and intellectual Vijay Iyer has compared seeing to listening. When we feel empathy for another person, our brain's mirror neurons fire, telling us to feel the way that they feel. We literally understand another's pain or joy at the root level of our being. Art or music or literature may move us in the same way. But studies have shown, Iron notes, perceptions of racialized difference get in the way of empathy. Between a baby's curiosity about difference and an adult's perception of difference, something has changed. We have learned to be compassionate or fearful before what we see. What made the last great consensus for racial justice possible? Here, Iyer speculates on the history of race, visuality, and popular music in the last half of the 20th century. This is where I'm trying to bridge, can't stop, won't stop with who we be. Vijay Iyer asks, is it possible that music heard and not seen which, of course, was scarcely possible before the advent of recorded music, might have overridden the visual, racialized, culturally imposed constraints on empathy. Could the essential humanity of African Americans been newly revealed for white American listeners in the 20th century through the disembodied circulation of quote-unquote race records? 
by activating in these listeners a neural understanding of the actions of African American performers? Could a new kind of cross racial empathy, or at least a new quasi utopic racial imaginary, have been inaugurated through the introduction of recorded sound? Listening, I suggest, may have been central in the making of the last great consensus for racial justice. The sonicality of race, powerfully shaped by 20th century black music, literally firing the national conscience. But after the civil rights movement, race became a new kind of American problem. The visuality of race, in all of its national history of erasure and debasement, became increasingly important simply because people of color would no longer remain invisible. With energy and urgency, artists and activists of color began to address the consequences of invisibility, the absence of representation, and the presence of misrepresentation. And so the new formal conditions of legal desegregation gave rise to a movement of art and ideas meant to bring about cultural desegregation. Its proponents came to name it multiculturalism. But as the ideas of the movement moved from its avant-garde uh, origins into art, into higher education, and then into the mainstream, it encountered powerful resistance, and thus began the era of what the conservative Pat Buchanan named the culture wars. These wars erupted in the last epoch of the 20th century because the multiculturalism movement and massive, dem massive demographic change prompted new discussions about democracy, particularly around the values of expression, recognition, inclusion, and empathy. Both sides in the culture wars understood and still understand that battles over culture are high stakes battles with important consequences. The struggle between retrenchment and change begins in culture. Culture is where change can be thwarted before it begins. It's also where change can be incubated. Politicals, pollsters, and pundits, those who believe in a science of change, fixate on the question of what is politically possible. But in any society, perhaps the more revealing and more productive question is the one asked of all of those who believe in the art of change. What is culturally possible? Thanks very much.
and I was lucky enough to be able to read, uh, read, to read who we be over the last two or three weeks, and the same thing is gonna happen. The same thing's gonna happen. This shit is about to change everything and make a lot of these people look like the hacks they are. So I'm really, <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy that I'm getting to share some space and time um, with Jeff. Uh, okay, so I have this novel coming out August 13th, uh, June 11th, called Long Division. Um, hopefully I will check that out. Uh, and I have another book coming out in August called How to Slowly Kill Yourselves and Others. And what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to read the introduction, uh, the prologue to that essay book. Um, we're calling it an essay book, but really it is shaped like an album of 13 or 14 uh, tracks and a few interludes. And, and, and what I'm going to read is just the beginning. And it's a letter to my uncle. And I think we should think about it, you know, letter in this so-called post-race era, written from uh, one black man slash boy uh, to his uncle. Um, and then we'll get it in. Thank y'all for coming. Thank my students, too, that I've taught. I'm, I'm happy to see y'all. can't believe y'all came out. I um, appreciate it. All right. It's called We Will Never Know. Dear Uncle Jimmy, as a black boy growing up in Mississippi, I learned that there was a rickety bridge between the right and the wrong. And I learned that I would be disciplined more harshly than white boys for even leaning toward the wrong side. But like you, Uncle Jimmy, I sadly didn't give a fuck. I broke bets I made with myself. I got kicked out of high school a number of times. I was suspended from college and I had run-ins with police that broke mom and grandma's heart. Unlike you, though, I did all of this in close proximity to a lanky, living, and breathing warning. Uncle Jimmy, that warning was you. On July 4th, you threw down your crack pipe, scrubbed yourself clean, and bought grandmama some meat. This mama's meat, you wrote in loopy black letters on a bloody paper sack. When your sister, my mama, called me in my office at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, she had no idea that the 4th of July would be the last day she would see you alive. You joked with your sisters before taking a little tray to get more bottle rockets. Reeking of that familiar mix of sour scalp and Jordan cologne, you probably blinked those huge webbed eyes more than usual and actually asked questions of our family. As with many of Mama's stories, you weren't the star. But you were the precocious, paroled man on whom our family emotional stability really rested. There was a terrible clarity in Mama's voice when she told me the story of July 4th. Mama's voice sounded like this any time you followed a crack binge or run in with the police with something graceful, like leading a Sunday school session or using your pension to buy that house over off Highway 35. You driving my mama crazy, Aunt Sue said, over 20 years ago, the night I drove mama to her first nervous breakdown. You headed down the same road as Jimmy. I learned that night that the Uncle Jimmy Road ran adjacent to the refined, curved avenues that nearly all sisters, aunts, mamas, and grandmamas wanted their black boys to travel. Aunt Sue and mama wanted me to know without a doubt that whatever consumed you would eventually consume me unless I prayed diligently, obeyed the law, remained clean, and got out of Mississippi by any means necessary. But even as I sprinted away from Mississippi to Ohio, then Indiana, and now New York, if I looked down, I could never really distinguish your footprints from my own. That's what I felt before July 7th. On July 7th, three days after you towed in a bag of meat to Grandma's house, I got a call. Grandma was looking for you. She drove over to your house because you wouldn't answer the phone. Grandma opened the screen door and pounded on your door that evening. Grandma yelled your name over and over again, but you didn't answer. You couldn't. On July 12th, eight days after bringing Grandmama her meat, your sisters walked into Matt Funeral Home and readied your black body, the body of Grandma's first child and their only brother for public viewing. They made the funeral director change his shirt. Your sister Sue, the most mesmerizing preacher in Mississippi, eulogized you in Concord Baptist Church that day. We were all baptized there. At the core of Sue's elegy, eulogy uh, were three ideas. Number one, niggas do not exist. Number two, perfectly sanitized, wholly responsible black people do not exist. Number three, you, Jimmy Alexander, were equally wicked and wonderful. And we had far more in common with you than we wanted to admit. Sue made the church know that you lived a life of bad. Not bad meaning good or bad meaning evil, but bad meaning bad and being human. In traditional Old Testament style, she explored justice and recreated in you someone who had prepared themselves for death 
are finally accepted and earning life in the days before your passing. Sue told the church the story of, your bringing up, of you bringing the meat to grandmama's house. She told us how you wrote this mama's meat. She told us that you had gotten your finances in order. She said, Jimmy wasn't that different than nobody else in this church. No better, no worse. And that's what we have to accept. He was part of our family. He was our brother. While Sue stood in the pulpit teaching us about acceptance of our badness, I realized that you were the only child of grandma who did not become a teacher. If you taught for a living, you might not have been physically or emotionally healthier, since we all know that occupations are never shields from reckless sex, drug abuse, cowardice, deceptiveness, and desperation. But grandma would have found far more peace the day of your funeral if she knew that her oldest child, a paroled black boy born in the late 1940s, taught somebody, somewhere, something before he died. As grandma's youngest daughter gave the church words to lean on your mother, our teacher, the thickest, most present human being either, any of us have ever met, folded up at the end of the pew. Grandma cried herself breathless as your bloodless black body lay right over the site of your baptism 55 years earlier. I held Grandma without Uncle Jimmy. I held her just like she would have wanted you to hold her if I were stretched out in that casket. I needed you, Uncle Jimmy. I needed you the day of the funeral, and we were both alive. I needed you to be better than you were. But I never loved you enough to tell you. I could have shown you by calling you more or walking with you down Old Morton Road when I visited during the summer and Christmas. We could have wondered about the wide roads and the huge dying trees we both imagined fighting off Godzilla and King Kong in our childhood. We could have joked and tossed our running jazz back and forth as some nephews and uncles do. Then if we really tried, we could have harnessed the courage to knock each other's hustle. I could have finally said, Uncle Jimmy, you're drowning yourself with that crack and all that hate. That's what they want us to do. Ain't nothing really behind that smile, Uncle Jimmy. I love you, and I need you to live. And you could have told me there's more than one way to drown, nephew. You're looking pretty wet yourself. I know I'm under that water, but do you know where you at? Those words were never said. We talked, but we didn't reckon with each other. Hence, all of our communication created no echo, no meaningful reverberation outside of our speculations about each other. The last thing you said to me the Christmas before you died was, no matter how much right you try to do, white folks do everything they can to make a nigga remember they owned us. There was a silence after the sentence, and I feel that silence with a mechanical head nod and a weak, yeah, I hear that. By that point, though, I believed you. I assume you cope with the weight of being a paroled black man in Mississippi by laughing, acting a fool, relying on crack cocaine, alcohol, and the manipulation of women who were just as hopeless as you. And I assume that you know I cope with the parole life in many of the same ways you did. One of the only differences between you and me was that I fell deeply in love with the possibility of written and spoken words. I believed, as Jeff Chang writes, in words that free. I used those words to create stories, essays, novels I thought you'd want to read, hear, and see. When I wasn't writing things that you might have wanted or needed to read or hear and see, I created fictive versions of you that were sadly more interesting and more loving than I ever allowed you to be in real life. You inspired thousands of paragraphs, hundreds of scenes, but I never even showed you one sentence. I was afraid to know for sure that you thought my work was a hustle, a shiny, indulgent waste of time. But more than that, I didn't want you to know that I wanted you to be better at being human. I didn't want you to see that I saw in the real you someone I never wanted to be, a shiftless, paroled nigga, worthy of only hollow awe and rabid disgust. A smiling nigga who fought a few good rounds before getting his ass whooped, fight after fight after fight. I believe that you forfeited your right to be a beautiful black human being, Uncle Jimmy. And, I, and predictably, I knew that I would become you. I hated you and me for that. This is a shameful admission, a confession that is even more sour of indulging guilt when I acknowledge that all of the women in our family, in my writing, who were based off the of characters of our family, Mama, Grandmama, Aunt Sue, and Aunt Linda, are far less moving, far less round, and far less paradoxical than the actual women themselves. And this has less to do with my writing than it does with our love and understanding of these human beings and our love and understanding of each other. I love the black women in our family enough to ask them questions. They love me enough to answer those questions, often with questions of their own. Echo.
honestly, I don't know if I ever asked you any questions other than why you look so happy in your Vietnam pictures when I was 10, and why you said there's some fine bitches on earth that year you picked me up from graduate school. My recreating more interesting characters based off uh, of you to fit the specifications of a paragraph doesn't make me despicable. It makes me an American writer. Mm -hmm. What makes me despicable is that one of the responsibilities of American writers is to broaden the confines, sensibilities, and generative capacity of American lit by broadening the scope of whom we write. You can't really explore the terror and wonder of being born, as Baldwin says, captive in a supposed promised land if one never conceived the colorful cactus as a crucial critics, not simply, simply consumers and objects of your work. Anyway, only a fool doesn't actively regret. I wish we could have waited in the awkward acceptance that we are neither African nor conventionally American, neither subhuman nor superhuman, neither tragic nor comic, neither defeated nor victorious. I wish we could have affirmed our awareness that our blackness and our southernness are both perpetual burden and benefit, and our masculinity, a measurable part of us that must perpetually be reckoned with. Mostly, Uncle Jimmy, I wish you could have told me that we have fucked up, and much of the nation needs it that way. But we owe it to our teachers and our students to imagine new routes into unconventional beauty and healthy relationships and compassionate citizenry and imaginative inquiry. We owe it to each other to love and insist on meaningful American revision until the day that we die. That's what I needed to tell you when you were alive. That's what I needed you to tell me. That's what I need to believe. One night while revising long division, I thank God that you weren't my father. By feeling like the luckiest nephew in the world to call someone as tortured as you my uncle, I wondered who and what I really would have become without you as my warning. I wondered how your life would have been different if I would have told you I loved you. What would you have done differently with your life if you really believed me? What would we both have felt? Uncle Jimmy, no matter how I contort these words, we will never ever know. This book is a love letter written five years too late. I'm sorry I didn't love you, your nephew, Kiesa. Came from and where the concept came from, 
because there's, a, I mean, obviously there's a lot going on in the book, and we can talk a little bit about that. But where did the where did the idea come from, and where did the the concept come from, just for the title itself? Um, the the uh, the idea for Long Division. Well, Long Division is is a, is really a love story. It's a meta love story. It's a novel within a novel. Um, and there are two characters, there are a lot of characters in the novel, but there's one character at one point says, you know, I wish you would just get to the point. Everything with you is like long division. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wrote that line years ago, and initially I, I titled the book something else, something crazy corny. Um, <laughs> but it was precious, it was mine, so it was hot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was so good, because I thought of it. And, um, and then after a while, I was just like, man, Long Division keeps coming up in this in this book, uh, literally, and it keeps coming up, uh, uh, I think, some ways, like, definitely metaphysically. So I, I just thought it made sense t to uh, call the book Long Division. And the book that the characters find in Long Division is called Long Division. So, you know, I wanted the reader to feel like they were part of the narrative by reading the book with the, the characters. You know, so. But yeah, it seems to me like there's, what you're trying to do is to, get to uh, a narrative around race. race. Race in some ways is maybe the long division, yeah. the long division that we've had right. historically. And, and you have the characters doing this cool, like Octavia Butler, like time shifting yeah. and that kind of thing, going back and forth between 1964 and 1985 and yeah. 2013, right. um, and trying to sort of present the whole of history. But it's almost like, uh, it's almost like at this particular time in history, what well, we've been through now, I guess, you know, five years of a historic presidency. Right. And people told us everything was supposed to change. Mm -hmm. And it really hasn't in right. a lot of ways. In some right. ways it's gotten worse. Yeah. Um, that we're, we're struggling to try to think up maybe, I know I see it in your work, um, a new narrative, how, yeah. to, how to explain where we're at now, yeah. where we're supposed to be beyond this long division, but mm -hmm. clearly we're not, right? Right, I and mean, one of the things I was thinking about with the book is, um, and this is, I think this is wholly tied into what you're doing and who we be is, you know, imagine to that was like, what happens if the multiculturalist and the multicultural uh, uh, apparatus, you know, had to face these mostly black kids from 1985, 2013, and 1964? What would happen? And ultimately, I want to say that I hope that the kids would whip multiculturalism ass, right? Mm -hmm. But but I, I don't necessarily think that's true. One of the things I was thinking when I read Who We Be is, you, you say early on in the book that the multiculturalists won, mm -hmm. right? They multiculturalists won. So I'm really interested in what what we would look like, what discourse would look like, what po public policy would look like if the multiculturalists did not win. Mm -hmm. Probably 1964. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you mean by with the multiculturalists ass? Because that's kind of interesting to me. like. If the kids had gone back in time, they would have whipped the multicultural assassin. Well, like, well I, I think, I, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to give away what I think the book actually does and say at the end, but okay. I, I think that the kids ultimately are, are, are scarred. Some of the kids don't make it. But, but, but what I'm hopefully saying in the book is that not just policy, but again, this, this, this kind of fluffy idea of multiculturalism can't win if we work with conviction and love and art, right, through the creation of, art, of, of alternative art. So what, what I hope people understand is they're reading the creation of alternative art. You, if multiculturalism had won, the Long Division wouldn't be published. Mm, you know what I'm right, saying? Right, and right. In, terms, in terms of meta. Right. And, yeah. and, 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 not, and not, you know, that's, yeah, we can talk about that a little bit more if you want. But, but again, this idea of multiculturalism winning, like you, I, I hadn't thought about it as explicitly until I, I read Who We Be. And again, you say the multicultural is one, and we see evidence of how they might have won. Um, but I'm interested, like, what, like, did they completely win? Did they really win? And you're like, yeah, they won. Well, no, I mean, actually, well, this is the whole thing about words like winning and victory and stuff, right? right? Is I mean, hip hop won, but did hip hop really win? You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's, it's. I kind of feel the same way about multiculturalism that I feel about hip hop mm. in a lot of ways. And that, so the multiculturalists start calling themselves multiculturalists mm. in the mid-70s. This is um, after all of the identity movements, black power, you know, brown power, yellow power, red power. Um, and it's sort of the natural evolution of, uh, of what needs
needs to happen for a lot of folks. Um, moving from cultural nationalism into building coalitions or hearing folks across race, across gender, across identity. Um, and, and Ishmael Reed actually comes up with the term. Right. Ishmael Reed, the, you know, the, the great San Francisco, uh, open based author, yeah. um, who uh, wrote Mumbo Jumbo. Yeah. And uh, so in 1975, he starts talking about the rise of all of these authors that he's terming the multiculturalists. And this avant-garde starts forming around this notion, right? And you start seeing this happening in, uh, uh, amongst feminists of color. Um, you start seeing it happening amongst a lot of writers of color. Yardbird, mm -hmm. his journal, um, moves from being a predominantly you know, black arts journal to being something that invites in all of these writers from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, it's kind of radical to talk about this notion of multiculture because there's only like, if you're, if you're not a multiculturalist, if you're a Pat Buchanan, there's only one American culture. Right. We're all assimilating to it, right? We're all the frogs in the pot and they're turning up the heat and stuff. And that like, whiteness is what we're getting all melted towards, right? Yeah. Um, in this melting pot. So it's, it's like there's one culture, there's one American civilization, everything is unitary. So just the idea that there could be multi-cultures within America, that there had always been multi-cultures in America, um, was pretty radical at the time. So they have this, this movement that's really short-lived, and I think really by the early 90s, the backlash is set in. Um, and uh, multiculturalism has moved to becoming an educational sort of policy, a way of dealing with diversity, dealing with a lot of folks who are coming now to the universities. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there's all these bodies now, 1965 Immigration Act, and and uh, you know just the growth of diversity right. um, happening. Uh, all these students are coming into uh, schools and into higher education, and this becomes uh, a battle about you know uh, about about a battle in a way. It's a it's sort of a meta battle. It becomes um, something that can be boxed away as diversity, um, and so I think that that's really critical to know just in the same way that hip hop started off as kids wanting to have fun, that there was something radical about it, and that this then, you know, becomes something that, that can put, get put on a record, right. right, and then it changes at that particular point, and at some point, uh, a lot of the teeth get pulled out, a mm -hmm. lot of the fangs get pulled out of hip hop, mm -hmm. um, as hip hop continues its commercialization. So the book changes in the middle, because where you really see multiculturalism taking place is uh, within corporations right. uh, and within the state. We're trying to figure out ways to contain diversity more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's a win, yeah, it's a victory, but it's also kind of uh, a big uh, a big failure. Yeah. In life. You know, in, in the last chapter of the book, you uh, quote uh, Sullivan from the Atlantic, and, 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 and you quote him saying, Is there you? Here? Is there you? Um, but one of the things you say is that after after the election of Obama, Sullivan said that beyond anything else, this election is going to prove to be a truce for race relations. Right? Well, like, what a sucker thing to say. <laughs> but but he meant it, and thankfully he said it. And and so you know when I was reading that, I I, I thought a lot about um, this accidental racist song. <laughs> where uh, Brad Paisley did what he's supposed to do. Right? Uh, this is what we expect of Brad, everybody who listened to Brad Paisley, he did exactly what he's supposed to do. And LL Cool J kind of did. Right? What do you think LL Cool J should do? Uh, well, I, I, I'll, I'll get to what I think he should have <laughs> But ultimately, ultimately, like most things, I think it's a critique of New York, and I want to diss New York and in New York later. Um, but, 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 for, but for now, Wait, do you think it, it was Brad Paisley's critique of New York, or Ella Cuja? Or I, you know, I mean, okay. So one thing I really think about this song is that I think if you get the the wackest MC out there, right, the MC who you think is like the most ignorant MC from the South, you could get. And I don't think these cats are ignorant, but I think people think they're. You get Scrappy from Love and Hip Hop. You could get uh, Trinidad James. I think if you got them on record, they would have pushed back far more than LL Cool J, uh -huh. no question. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that pushback would have been because they represent a region that wouldn't have had it any other way. You have to push back if you're a Southern MC 
hearing white Southerners say the shit he said on that record. For some reason, New York, I guess, is cool with LL Cool J maybe saying what he said. That's what I want to try to, but I want to say that later, like, near the end. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but, 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 of course you get to your punchline. Right. Really. But, but what Sorry. I really want to say is, like, what do we make of LL Cool J's uh, rhyme in some way being really in line with um, Obama's race speech, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, this conciliatory approach, black people need to get better, White folks need to get better. If we really push, we can get better together. I mean, LL Cool J, this must be a, might be a generous reading of it, but I think that's what he was trying to do, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I'll forget this if you forget this, right. right? It's the truth. And we expect that from politicians, right? Even people who love Obama expect that from Obama. I, I don't understand why or how LL Cool J is allowed from his hometown to say what he said. Right. Well, I think there was a lot of pushback. I mean, I'm not trying to defend New York, because I'm from the West Coast. Right. <laughs> but um, I think there was a lot of pushback. I mean, it's interesting, too, that these are the two ad libs, right? This, right? this is after his verse. So he says, for those of you who haven't heard the song, he's, something, he's saying something like, I don't have the words correct necessarily, but uh, uh, if, if you forget my do-rag, I'll forget your red flag. And, but it's even uh, worse than that. Can I just say something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, well, what's even worse is that it's, it's, it's call and response. If you listen to the song, he's doing it in call and response, right? right. Paisley has his line. Right. LL yeah. has his line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paisley has his line. LL has his line. Right. So, so, so literally, it's using not just a hip hop trope, but it's using a trope that's like rooted in black Southern tradition. That's right. And in that, using that trope, he's saying, I'm literally going to forget slavery. Right. If you can forget these fucking gold chains around the my chains, neck. And I'll forget the iron chains right. or something like that. Right. While Paisley singing about Southern Right. Queens. And there was pushback. Right. You're right. There, there has yeah. been pushback. I think there's been a lot of pushback. Um, but there's a but, though, right? No, there's a but. There's yeah. absolutely a but there. Um, I think, so two things. One is, is and this is what I love about, uh, about your book of essays, right? Um, your book of essays is, it's not just you. You know, in the, in the old traditional sense, uh, nonfiction essay books are written to really aggrandize, right. you know, people's uh, uh, ability to be like the big, great opinion makers, yes. you know. And, you know, that's sort of the, the, the thing that goes on. But in your book, it's multivocal, right? You, a lot of it is actually really old fashioned. You have letters that you're sending to friends. Friends are responding uh, to family members, to your mother. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's a really poignant, way to end the book actually is the dialogue that you're having with your mom. And I thought, for me, that's representing the point that we need to be at, which is actually having conversations, actually being brutally honest. What did you say, man? You had this beautiful thing um, about truth, you know, about we need, as you just said it, we owe it to each other to love and insist on meaningful revision until the day that we die. And, mm -hmm. and, and to be able to, to do this um, in dialogue, mm -hmm. right, and to be really brutally honest with that. And we haven't had a real race dialogue mm -hmm. since Clinton had that thing back in 1997 right. saying we're about to have this race conversation, right. and then Monica Lindsay came along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of it's sort of interesting to me that they're having now this conversation that's, it's 200 years old. They're using language that's 200 years old, mm -hmm. right? He's talking about the point. South, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. And, and what the rebel flag means to him in terms of, of losing the Civil War. Right. Like, okay, what was the Civil War fought for again, Brad Paisley, history lesson? Right. Like, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and then, of course, L.L. was put in a position of, okay, if I need to respond to this, I can either go deep and remind him of that, or I just have to act like, you know, it's all good. We don't actually have any history. Right. And so what I, I want to want to write about in the book, what I've been writing about is this forgetting that happens. Yeah. It's sort of this imperial nostalgia that kind of happens, right? right? That, that folks don't want to actually deal with any of this stuff. They just rather forget it. So every time we have a change or a shift or a breakthrough, you know, around race, um, it's like we act like it always is there. Mm -hmm. And it's, the, it's, it's a mode that serves uh, conservatism really well. Mm -hmm. It's a move that serves corporatism really, really well, right. right? It's just like we're living in this eternal present, you know, where there's no history. And, and if we have this relationship to history, it's supposed to be like, oh, it's all good. <laughs> right. We, you know, we're supposed to just live through the trauma yeah. and just be like, 
making it through the trauma. That's just an American way, right? right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about your, your essays is that you're like, no, we